Hi, I'm Anne Urza Leggett and I have volunteered for the Concord Free Public Library for many years and I'm currently on the Friends of the Library board and I'm thrilled to be here getting the chance to read a chapter from the Penderwicks. I um, am one of four girls, uh, one of four sisters, so this tale of four sisters, two rabbits and a very interesting boy is um, close to my heart. I am going to be reading chapter nine, Shocking News. I tried to stop you from coming to the party, but you wouldn't listen to me. I knew it would be awful, said Jeffrey. He and the four sisters were outside on the wide stone veranda that ran along Arundel Hall. They had escaped as soon as they could, which meant not until they had finished dinner and birthday cake. Not that anyone had much appetite left after Mrs. Tifton's announcement. Not with that grim old general staring down at them like a horrible warning. Someday Geoffrey will be just like me. It wasn't that awful a party, said Jane. Yes, it was, said Skye. Geoffrey's right. Shh, they'll hear you. Rosalind was peeking through big French doors back into the dining room. Mrs. Tifton and Dexter were still at the table drinking coffee. I don't care if they hear us, said Geoffrey. That was the worst birthday party ever in the history of the world. You shouldn't have been here. It was humiliating. It was partly our fault, though, said Rosalind. We upset your mother. Jane and her country club fit for kings, said Skye. What about you and your astrophysics, said Jane. Actually, I like that part, said Geoffrey, his frown disappearing. You never told us about that Pensy Military Academy, said Jane. I don't like talking about it. Geoffrey's frown was back. Besides, Grandfather didn't start there until he was 12, so Mother says I can wait until I'm 12, too. Anything can happen in a year. Mother could forget all about it, right? Sure. Jane didn't look sure. Have you told her you don't want to go? Rosalind asked. Whenever I try, she starts talking about how wonderful my grandfather was and how much I remind her of him. Do I seem like the military type to you? No, said Skye firmly. Not that you couldn't be a ferocious hero and all that, said Jane. Thanks, but I'd hate going to war. Geoffrey flung himself onto a stone bench. And golf, I hate golf too. I can't believe Mother bought me those stupid golf clubs, and now I have to be tortured with lessons at the country club. Why not just kill me now and be done with it? Batty sat down next to Geoffrey. Don't be upset. We have more presents for you. While Jane ran off to retrieve the presents from under the Greek pavilion, Rosalind tried to cheer up Geoffrey with the story of Hound throwing up on Skye's shoes. Skye and Betty, Batty, helped by acting it out with Batty as Hound and Skye as herself, squishing dramatically up and down the terrace. They had him almost forgetting about Pensy and the golf clubs. For a moment, they thought he was even going to laugh when Jane arrived. Here they are, wrapped in everything. Jane dropped the bulging shopping bag at Jeffrey's feet. But no birthday card, said Rosalind. We had one, but Hound ate it, said Batty. The first present was a book from Rosalind and Jane, and Mr. Penderwick, too, because they'd run out of pocket money, Jane told Geoffrey, about famous orchestra conductors with lots of photographs of them in their orchestras. Geoffrey thought this a wonderful gift. Much better than golf clubs, he said. The second present was Skye's, a brown and green camouflage hat identical to hers. Geoffrey put it on and looked happily happier than he had all evening. The third present was from Batty and only Rosalind knew what it was. Geoffrey held it up to his ear and shook it, but it made no sound. What is it, he asked. Open it, said Batty, wriggling with excitement. Animal, vegetable, or mineral, he asked. Open it, shrieked Batty, almost tumbling off the bench. It was a framed photograph of Hound. Oh, thank you, Geoffrey gave Batty a smile. I love it. Batty, said Jane. That's your favorite picture of Hound, the one you keep by your bed. She said she wanted to give it to Geoffrey. I asked her four times, right, Batty? said Rosalind. Yes, and maybe he'll let me borrow it back sometime, said Batty. Batty, you can't say that, said Rosalind. And Geoffrey grabbed Batty and tickled her until she shrieked. 
Jane looked like she was about to join in when Skye held up her hand and told them all to be quiet. I hear music. Everyone listened. The music seemed to be coming out of another set of French doors farther down the veranda. That's the drawing room, said Geoffrey. Let's go look. The five of them crept along the veranda and peered into the drawing room. By now it was almost dark outside, so that while people inside wouldn't be able to see the children, the children could easily see them. It was Mrs. Tifton and Dexter, and they were dancing. It's a waltz, whispered Geoffrey. How do you know, whispered Skye. Mother made me take dance class the last year. Here, I'll show you. Geoffrey grabbed Skye. One, two, three, one, two, three. He moved forward to the music and ran smack into her. You're supposed to go backward when I go forward. It's called following. Forget it, said Skye. Show Rosalind. Geoffrey took hold of Rosalind and tried again. One, two, three, one, two, three. This time it worked and they waltzed along the veranda. Jane clutched Batty and pushed her backward. One, two, three, one, two, three. We're doing it, she whispered excitedly and forgetting to watch where she was going, shoved Batty into a giant pot of flowers. They both crashed to the ground giggling. In a flash, Skye ran over to the French doors and shoved Jane and Batty off the veranda. Hide, she hissed as Rosalind and Je she hissed at Rosalind and Geoffrey. In seconds, all five of them had leapt off the veranda and crouched behind a thick clump of bushes. They heard Mrs. Tifton and Dexter step onto the veranda. There's no one out here, Brenda, said Dexter. I thought I heard something, said Mrs. Tifton. Probably just Jeffrey running around with his girlfriends. Skye silently pretended to gag and throw up, which would have made Jeffrey laugh if Rosalind hadn't clapped her hand over his mouth. Don't even say such a thing. He's much too young for girlfriends, said Mrs. Stifton. And when the time comes, he will pick a girl from a backroom similar to his own. Not like those Penderwick girls who are a little vulgar, don't you think? Definitely not in our class. No one's in your class, darling. Flatter. The girls could almost hear Mrs. Tifton preening like a peacock. Truly, though, Dex, I am concerned about the Penderick's influence on Geoffrey. He hasn't been himself since they arrived. You worry too much. In a few weeks, they'll be gone and forgotten. Come on, let's dance out here, said Dexter. And for a while, all, children, all the children could hear was Mrs. Tifton's high heels on the veranda. One, two, three, one, two, three. There was no pretend throwing up or smothered laughter in the bushes now. It was hard to know which of the five children was the most uncomfortable. Jeffrey appeared to be the worst. He was purple with embarrassment. But the Penderwick family pride had been greatly wounded. Skye looked ready for battle, and Rosalind was furiously scolding herself. She knew that hearing bad things about yourself is one of the punishments for eavesdropping. Her father had taught her that a long time ago. Her wonderful father. How he would despise what that woman had just said. Class is as class does, he would say, but probably in Latin. Dexter was talking again. Just think, Brenda, this could be Paris. Close your eyes and imagine waltzing along the Seine. Mmm, Paris, said Mrs. Tifton, like she had been eating, like she had just eaten chocolate mint ice cream. I haven't been to Paris for years, not since Papa took me there for my 16th birthday. I haven't been anywhere for years. We wouldn't have to stop at Paris. We could go to Copenhagen, London, Rome, Vienna, anywhere you want. Let's set a date. We've been over this already. I need to go over it again. How much longer do I have to wait? You know I want to marry you, Brenda, and take you on a fabulous honeymoon. And you know I want to marry you. Jeffrey gasped so loudly that Rosalind thought his mother and Dexter had to hear it. But they were too absorbed in each other. Then what are we waiting for? Explain it to me, love. Jeffrey, this is about us, not Jeffrey. If I just knew what was, would be best for him. What's best for his mother is best for him, and I know what's best for his mother. Then came noises that sounded suspiciously like kissing. Rosalind put her hands over Batty's ears and glanced at Geoffrey. He had his face buried in his arms. How much more could he take? The music stopped, 
and Dexter was talking again. I've been looking into Pensy. Do you know they allow boys to start as young as 11? Why not send Jeffrey there this year? You mean this September? Next month? Dexter, he's my baby. Of course he is, but the sooner he starts Pensy, the better chance he'll have of eventually going to West Point. You've told me how much that meant to your father. It meant the world to him. Mrs. Tifton's voice dropped. Since he didn't have a son to follow in his footsteps. Well, I know someone who's glad the general had a daughter. The dreadful kissing noises started up again and lasted for what seemed like eternity. When Mrs. Tifton and Dexter at long last broke apart and went back inside, no one wanted to talk or even look at each other. Finally, Rosalind touched Geoffrey on his shoulder. It'll be all right, she said. Geoffrey shook her hand away and stood up. I've got to go. See you tomorrow, asked Sky. I, I guess so. Geoffrey angrily grabbed his, rubbed his eyes with the back of his hand. Thanks for coming. Happy birthday, Geoffrey, said Jean. Don't forget your presents, said Batty. But he was already gone. The sisters crept sadly back onto the veranda to gather up the gifts. We're lucky Mrs. Tifton didn't notice all this stuff. Rosalind picked up the torn wrapping paper and crumpled it into a ball. She was too busy kissing Dexter. Skye kicked the stone bench. Rosalind was Jeffrey, right? Said, asked Batty. Was this the worst birthday party ever in the history of the world? Of course not, said Rosalind. Skye kicked the bench again. Close, though. Late that night, in her attic bedroom, Jane finished another chapter of her book. In this one, Ms. Horiferous told Arthur that she meant to keep him locked up forever. Why? Why? he cried. I like to torment you, she cackled. Please, please let me go, begged Arthur. Never, she cried, and swept out of the room. Arthur furiously beat his fists against the wall of his prison. He would do anything to get away. Where was Sabrina Star? When would she return for him? And would she have figured out how to get him out the window and into her hot air balloon? Jane put down her pen and closed her notebook. She knew she should go to bed, but she wasn't at all sleepy. She kept going over the evening in her mind, especially the very end when Geoffrey ran off alone into the darkness. What a horrible way to find out that your mother was getting married. And that man she was marrying wanted to ship you off to military school for a whole year early. Jane needed someone to talk to. She slid her feet into slippers, tiptoed downstairs, and pushed open Skye's door. Skye, are you asleep? Yes. I have to talk about Jeffrey. Go away or I'll kill you. Jane shut the door and went back to the hall and pushed open Rosalind's door. Although all her lights were out, Rosalind wasn't in bed. She was standing at the window, staring out into the night. Rosalind? Rosalind turned. Oh, Jane, you startled me. What were you doing? I was thinking about um, lots of things. Why are you still awake? Jane sat down on Rosalind's bed. I can't stop worrying about Jeffrey. We talked about all this on the way home. There's nothing we can do right now. We could ask Daddy to adopt him. Rosalind sat down beside her. Don't be ridiculous. We could write a letter to Mrs. Tifton explaining why Jeffrey shouldn't go to military school. We'd do better with the adoption scheme, said Rosalind. Go to bed, Jane. It's late. You're right. Jane stood up and then sat down again. I have something else to talk about. Rosalind sighed and lay down. Go ahead. Do you think it would be disloyal to Jeffrey if I asked Dexter for help with my book? He's a real life publisher. I might never meet another one. This could be my last chance. The point isn't whether or not you'd be disloyal to Jeffrey. The point is whether Dexter meant what he said about helping you and he probably didn't because he's not a nice person. This is not your last chance. You're only 10, so forget all about it and go back to sleep. Jane slipped up, back upstairs and got into bed. She told herself that Rosalind was right, that it was silly to count on anything from a creep like Dexter, 
But then Jane had an idea and sat up in bed with excitement. Maybe Dexter wasn't always a creep. Maybe he had two sides, like the doc, that Dr. Jekyll person in the play the sixth grade had put on last spring. Dr. Jekyll was a nice man until he drank a secret potion which turned him into the horrible Mr. Hyde, played to dastardly perfection by Rosalind's friend Tommy Geiger in a fake black beard. Maybe the man who was Mrs. Tifton's nasty boyfriend was the bad Mr. Hyde side of Dexter. Then the good Dr. Jekyll side of Dexter, called Mr. Dupree, would be a wise, kind publisher who would be only too eager to help young writers find their destinies. It was that man, the Mr. Dupree side, who had said at dinner he'd look at the Sabrina Star book when it was finished. Jane settled back onto her pillow. It was a theory. Maybe a good one, maybe not, but she would keep it to herself because her sisters would only laugh at her. In the meantime, she would work hard and write the best book she could. She closed her eyes and went to sleep, and all that night she dreamt about being a famous and distinguished author. That's the end of chapter nine. Thanks for listening. Bye.